Hi, my name is Scott Smith. I'm one of the medics for Divers Alert Network and also the course director for our pre-hospital medicine courses. For the next 30 to 40 minutes, I want to talk to you a little bit about defining dive safety for public safety divers. One thing I want you to keep in mind as we get into this presentation is take a look at some of the disabling injuries and fatalities that we have seen over the past number of years related to scuba diving fatalities. This particular slide encompasses all different types of diving from recreational, commercial, technical, and public safety. So it's overall, but I want you to think about this as we start to get into our presentation. If you'll take a look at the primary cause of death being drowning, for example. When we start talking about some more specific disabling type of injuries, you'll be able to put this into a little bit of context of some of the things that eventually end up leading to the drowning which obviously results in fatality. So dive accidents in general, and once again, it doesn't matter what type of diving you're doing, whether it is public safety diving to just out having a good time with recreational, there typically is a chain of events or a sequence of events. You rarely see things such as train crashes, plane crashes, other major events like that being caused by one single item. Oftentimes there was a sequence or a chain of events which produced this uh, final outcome. And the same happens with diving. We often see that a chain of events occurs and if you can focus on trying to break one of the links in this chain, you can often prevent the end result and everything works out well. So for the overview of the presentation, we're going to take a look at how much of a broad category public safety diving really is take a look at some of the scene management issues ranging from proper SOPs or standard operating procedures, equipment, training, knowing when not to send your team members in, and recognition, prevention, and some of the intervention that's crucial in trying to keep a public safety dive a safe dive. So let's look at who exactly is a public safety diver. Essentially, we think of PSDs as either a professional, paid, or volunteer law enforcement or fire department based dive team. There are plenty of teams out there that exist as solely law enforcement and solely fire department based. Both have equal footing, but typically we consider public safety divers as being affiliated with one of these types of organizations. It's really important to note that a public safety dive team should have specialized and specific training in public safety diving. Some of the broad range of activities they have is everything from light salvage of perhaps a vessel that is sunk in large waterways to mapping underwater crime scenes. Since 2001, obviously, port and harbor safety and security has become a really big part of public safety diving. We have a lot of teams now that go as far as doing uh, underwater uh, explosives and demolition work. Obviously body recovery, evidence recovery. Most of the time these are some of the primary things public safety divers are doing as their normal activities. Proper SOPs for your dive team need to look at everything from addressing qualifications of members and that's not just the divers themselves but also who are some of your support personnel for the divers. For example your tenders, medical standby, team leaders, uh, and other you know, equipment management. Looking specifically at equipment, what are some of the potential callouts that your team might face? For example, do you have the potential for life salvage work or are you strictly going to be doing evidence and or body recoveries? Are you going to be in inland calm waters? Do you have the potential for being out in open water with, with current surge and tides that need to be contended with. So all of these are things that need to come up in your SOPs when you're considering some of the things to keep your public safety divers uh, in a safe environment. Have specific protocols for your callouts. Have a set of criteria that you're looking at if this is going to be a rescue. And typically by a rescue we're looking at the potential obviously to save life and even sometimes property. Or is this simply going to be a recovery dive? Are you recovering evidence? Are you recovering property? Are you recovering a body? So criteria for your callouts on that. Obviously rescue becomes a much more time sensitive. Recovery, you might have a little bit more time 
to stop, plan, wait for the proper conditions. Protocols for your training dives. Every public safety dive team needs to be training on a regular basis, training for the callouts that you have, training for all possible contentions, training and in, for new equipment, training to keep everybody communicating properly together and functioning as a single team. Once again, not just your divers, but all of your support personnel as well. Scene management is an important part of public safety diving, whether you're on a training dive or on an actual call out. You have divers and safety divers. Your divers obviously being your primary divers in the water doing whatever the operation is, but also safety divers are a very important part of these. Safety divers range from the 90% diver or basically the diver who is dressed to the point where getting fully dressed and operational takes just a minimal amount of time. Essentially, they are 90% dressed and ready to standby safety divers that might take a little bit longer to get in the water, but are also there nearby and have all of their equipment handy. Very, very important to your divers is the tender. The individual or individuals who are on the surface supporting the divers and communicating with them, helping with the operations, basically training the responsibilities for that particular diver's safety in everything from conditions that may be changing on land or on the water that the diver may not be aware of to the potential for having to move the divers or even recall them. Obviously an incident commander. Sometimes the incident commander is a person dedicated solely to the incident command or if this is a very small operation your incident commander could very easily be one of your divers or even one of your tenders. Medical standby is important to consider because you never know when one of your divers might have a problem. This could be anything from having an advanced life support crew from local EMS on call or on standby on scene to you have dive medical technicians who are part of your team and trained in dive specific medical interventions. On some larger callouts where there may be a lot of evidence to collect, in order to maintain chain of custody, it might be a good idea to have evidence technicians on hand. So as soon as a piece of evidence comes up, it immediately goes from diver to evidence technician. It helps to maintain a small chain of custody and could be useful later on in court. One final important note of scene management, logistics of the area and of the water to search. Especially if this is an area that you have not been in or have been training in, really understanding what's around, what's underwater, what potential hazards are existing down there. You might want to consider even sending in ROVs or side scan sonar if this is an area that you're not particularly familiar with. Communications with topside with the other divers can be done through a variety of different means. Radio communications, if you're using full face masks with communications, obviously you can maintain constant communications with your divers and your topside team members. If your divers are going to be tethered, making sure that your tenders and your divers have a universal set of line signals. For example, one tug means one thing, two tugs means another thing. If you consider communications from the ICS point of view, will multiple teams participating in large callouts together, will they be communicating in the same way? For example, do you use plain language or do you use TIN codes, signal codes, other things like that? One thing that ICS has really brought into view is the communication between teams when participating in larger scale events. The same holds true when you're doing larger scale underwater operations with multiple dive teams. Is everyone speaking the same language? For example, tether divers using line signals. Again, is everyone speaking the same language? So not just the language of your team being clearly established, but also once again if you're participating with other teams, is the language clearly established that everyone can understand together? Here's an example of a communications document that's available for download to any public safety diver off of the International Association of Dive Rescue Specialists website. And at the end of this presentation, we'll give you that website where all these materials will be available to you. For example, these downloads on SOPs. But this one that we're looking at here 
international public safety diver line signals, we see an example of tender to diver and diver to tender and some of the line signals for tether divers. For example, one pole, two poles, three poles, and four poles. In the beginning, one of the things I talked about very briefly was proper training for your public safety dive team. Also keep in mind that the current level of training that your public safety divers may have might not be appropriate for all of the callouts they face. So you may need to know when to bring in other teams or when to say this is beyond the capability of our training, this is beyond the capability of our particular team. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in saying that. It's done all the time in land-based operations. The exact same holds true for underwater operations. This is one area where a team can very easily get themselves in trouble by trying to do call-outs or training operations that are beyond the scope of their equipment, their training, and their comfort levels. Some examples of recognized public safety diver programs, and please keep in mind this is not an all-encompassing list, but uh, just a few examples are Dive Rescue International, ERDI, and PADI. All three offer specific public safety diver programs. One important aspect of training is the annual scuba skills evaluation. This example of the document available for you from IDRS is download, looks at just the annual skills that they recommend each public safety diver go through. Not just new team members, but also your existing team members as well. Looking at everything from equipment handling and setup to their watermanship skills and their specific scuba diving skills. So what's the proper equipment that's needed for your team? Well, a lot of that is going to depend on what type of callouts, training, and water your team is going to have. Obviously, this will be different for every team, but some of the things to think about are your exposure suits, for example. When trying to keep your divers safe, obviously their exposure in the water is a very important part of this. If you have the potential for diving in contaminated water or exposure to other hazardous materials, your exposure suits need to be suitable for that particular body of water. One thing that a lot of teams uh, do is, and unfortunately it all comes down to budget money, but a lot of teams are diving in wetsuits and they're in water that is contaminated and not really proper for wetsuits. They really should be in either an encapsulated suit or in a dry suit. Think about the decontamination procedures that might be needed for some of the hazards that your team could face if on an exposure. And this ranges everything from fuel from a sunken vehicle to on a body recovery, decon from any body substances or body fluids that could be encountered in the water. Obviously you do have the one advantage of a vast body of water diluting things but you really do need to consider proper decontamination and, and exposures. It's generally recommended that all public safety divers dive in a full face mask. It allows for better communication. No, I don't like that part. Um, generally, as standardized equipment, we often see that full face masks are the recommended items for public safety divers. Standardized equipment for your team Ideally, your team is all diving in the same equipment. It lets your divers and your tenders be familiar with everything. Again, things coming down to budget money, sometimes you do have different types of equipment, so everyone on your team needs to be familiar with that. If you're doing light salvage, you're going to be doing lifting, moving of objects. You need to consider whether helmets are needed. In some of your dives, you may need that head protection. Also, if you're going to be doing penetration or entry into overhead environments. Having the proper ropes and lift bags for whatever it is that you're doing. For example, again, if you're recovering vehicles, obviously you need specialized lift bags for the recovery of vehicles. Documenting underwater crime scenes, having proper cameras available to do that. Your divers on their tethers, is it more appropriate for your divers to have a quick release tether that they can quickly get out of? Or for the example of overhead environments or even ice diving is a more solid harness without a quick release tether going to be the proper thing. So the proper equipment for your dive team really comes down to looking at every potential call out that your divers may face. 
When looking at the proper equipment for your dive team and your divers specifically, don't forget about your tenders and other surface support personnel. They need to also have the proper equipment. Everybody who is in the water hazard zone, for example, needs to be wearing personal flotation devices and even the potential for helmets there, depending on what the operations are going to be. Some of the adjunct equipment that's available now to public safety divers really actually makes the job much safer and much simpler. It minimizes the amount of time that the divers actually have to spend in the water. The technology that's available today for remote operated vehicles and even side scan sonars really lets you take a look at what's underwater and pin down specific targets to send your divers down to for short periods of time, look at that specific target or do what needs to be done, bring them up and get them out of the water. It, it's kind of ironic to think about the public safety dive team as trying to spend as little time in the water as possible, but the adjunct equipment really adds to the safety for your public safety dive team. Medical fitness to dive for public safety divers is very different from other types of working divers. The environment that you're going to be working in and the potential again for your different types of call outs really is going to dictate what the medical fitness to dive for your specific team members and your support surface personnel are going to end up being. If your team is restricted to using whoever your department or organization uses for their occupational health and they don't have the specific knowledge in diving medicine, Dan and others are available to consult with your occupational health providers and answer any questions related to their medical fitness to dive for your team members and your support personnel. Believe it or not, a very important piece of medical fitness to dive is enjoying the benefits of very good buoyancy control. One of the most common injuries that we see in divers across the board, ear and sinus barotrauma. Your team specifically, especially if you're going to be working in shallow dives, which is a norm for many public safety divers, you're in the area where ear and sinus barotrauma most commonly occurs, these very shallow depths. Your divers need to be really skilled at their descents, ascents, and keep in mind, just because they are professional and working divers doesn't mean that their ears and sinuses are going to be any less susceptible to these very common injuries. Any recent barotrauma, allergy, cold symptoms, you need to have a lot of caution whether or not to put your diver in the water with that. Even a couple of days following a recent cold or congestion, you can still have a little bit of residual inflammation and swelling, which might make it a little bit more difficult for your divers. If you have a diver that is having chronic difficulty, I'd consider consulting an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Cardiovascular fitness is very important because 25 to 30 percent of all dive fatalities end up being cardiac related. So your divers and your support team need to keep good heart healthy diets and fitness always in mind. One of the common questions that we receive here at Dan from all types of divers is, is this medication okay to dive with? Something that you need to keep in mind when talking about medications and diving is most of the time it comes down to the underlying medical condition that that medication is being used for. There are certain types of medications which can cause some additional concerns in the water, for example blood thinners being one of them. They can take a simple ear or sinus injury and sometimes make it a much more complicated injury. But basically the medication comes down to again your underlying condition. We always recommend that divers who are 40 and over get an annual physical. Generally this isn't going to be a problem for you because your public safety divers and support personnel should be getting their annual physicals and their annual medical fitness to dive exams. If for whatever reason your team doesn't do an annual medical fitness to dive exam, we do recommend this for people at least 40 and over. Don't always rely on the annual exam that your divers and support personnel are getting, but also keep in mind that health status is a very dynamic thing. We have temporary conditions, we have chronic conditions. Not every chronic condition is going to keep your divers out of the water, but some temporary conditions may need to keep them out of the water for that short period of time. So one of the big questions, what age do you stop diving? What age is it considered that your team member should retire 
from their water operations? Well, there's really not an answer for that. Self-assessment of your divers needs to be very brutally honest. Your divers and support personnel need to be honest when they're doing their annual exams. And you might need to adjust their position on the team based on their health status at the time or based upon their age. That's something that you and your team need to decide. But one thing to consider though, it's not necessarily the years, it's the mileage on the body. Physical fitness in your divers and your support personnel obviously is very, very critical and crucial. Regular exercise obviously helps keep better health. It helps to reduce the risk of additional medical problems. There are a lot of resources available to you for helping your divers increase their exercise stamina and their water stamina. You can find these on alertdiver.com and an Alert Diver magazine available for download. Simply do a search for physical fitness or exercises for diving off of our website and lots and lots of articles are available for you to download. This table that you're looking at can give you a good overall assessment at where your divers and support personnel fall in their general overall cardiovascular and medical fitness. For example, take as someone who's a male age 40 to 49, if they can do greater than 39 push-ups, they're generally considered to be in excellent physical condition. We would like to give special thanks to IADRS, the International Association of Dive Rescue Specialists, and to DUI, Diving Unlimited International, for assisting with the development and delivery of this presentation. Many of the documents you saw throughout this webcast relating to SOPs for public safety divers, the annual waterman ship test, all of these are available for download free of charge from the IADRS website, which is www iadrs.org. You can find additional information on diving in contaminated waters on DUI's website at www.dui-online.com and downloading the risk management for public safety divers and professionals.